Senator Hawley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to the nominees uh, for being here. You know, we've heard from a lot of nominees who've come before this committee from this administration a lot about equity and about fairness being top priorities in today's DOD. But I have to say, that just doesn't seem to bear out to be the facts. And Ms. Fulton, your nomination is a perfect example of it. What we've actually seen is targeting political opponents, targeting people who the administration doesn't agree with, trying to silence folks who they don't like. Clearly, it's a priority for this administration because they've been focused on that rather than doing things like, oh, I don't know, managing the evacuation from Afghanistan, where we have, let me remind this committee yet again, 13 service members dead, hundreds of civilians dead, potentially thousands of Americans left behind enemy lines. Why? Because the DOD is focused on their radical left agenda rather than on actually saving Americans and doing their jobs. Now, Ms. Fulton, I'm, I'm, I'm astounded, frankly, that you've been nominated. And listen, you're entitled to have whatever views you want. Look, I'm a constitutional lawyer. I'm actually a religious liberty lawyer by training. Your faith is your faith. Your views are your views. You can say whatever the heck you want. This is the United States of America. But you're asking to be appointed to a very important position in the DOD let me come back to some of these statements that you made. Uh, religious freedom is twisted to mean conservative Christians can dictate their beliefs to the rest of us. Hashtag Hobby Lobby, repeal RIFRA. When did you change your view on RIFRA? You told Senator Cotton you're not in favor of repealing it. You were on June 30th, 2014. When did you change your mind? I couldn't tell you exactly, Senator. Why did you change your mind? I couldn't tell you exactly, Senator. You're choosing not to tell me, or you don't want to engage, or you don't like this line of questioning, or you don't think you need to be responsive? Oh, I'm sorry, Senator. Of course, I, I do mean to be responsive. Um, I don't recall the details of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and I want to be clear that I support religious freedom. I support the rights of our troops and our civilian employees uh, to their religious freedom to the entire extent that the law allows within their employment in the Department of Defense. And I support that in every way as a, yes, sir. Why is it that you think that the vast majority of, of white evangelical leaders are utterly unmoored from the gospel of Jesus Christ? Can you explain that to me? Senator, I, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I have had differences of opinion um, from people who um, uh, don't believe in, in full equality for all, um, but I will say it is wrong. It was wrong for me in that, that moment, and I believe it is always wrong to tarnish an entire group of people with the beliefs or actions of one or a few, and for that I apologize. You said that uh, if getting a Supreme Court judge who'd outlaw abortion makes all of this worth it to you, referring to evangelicals, your religion has nothing to do with Jesus. You also say 86% of those who consider themselves white evangelicals support Trump. So which part of it is disqualifies these people as Christians? Is it that they are opposed to abortion or they supported Trump or both? Help me understand your thinking. I'm so sorry, Senator. Could you read that again? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. on, on September 4th, you said, 2017, 86% of those who consider themselves white evangelicals support Trump. You said uh, in the same tweet thread, if getting a Supreme Court judge who'd outlaw abortion makes all this worth it to you, your religion has nothing to do with Jesus. So is it because they supported Trump that they're not followers of Jesus, or is it because they oppose abortion? Is it both? I'm trying to, Senator, I'm trying to put myself back in that moment. I know there were several points at which I felt that the president had, had made statements or taken actions that I felt were in direct contradiction with the way that I understand Jesus' teaching. And I'm expecting that I was reacting to that. Um, and uh, again, I don't believe we should ever tarnish a whole group of people for the actions of one. Do you think that it's your position to, to tell people when they are and aren't followers of Christ or truly Christians no, or not just because they disagree with you? I understand you disagree with these folks, but saying over and over that they're not followers of Jesus. You cited Matthew 23 on August 29th, 2017. 
when you said the vast majority of white evangelical leaders are utterly unmoored from the gospel of Jesus Christ, Matthew 23 applies. You remember what you meant by that? Maybe a reference to the brood of vipers. That's Matthew 23. Yes, Senator. Um, Senator, none of none of what I would have none of what I've ever expressed on social media was intended to silence others. I believe there's a free expression of beliefs there, but I do believe that I apologize for statements at any time when I tarnished a whole group of people for the actions or statements of one or a few. And well, it's clearly meant to denigrate others. Listen, my time has expired. I just have to say, Ms. Fulton, it's not one statement. It's multiple statements over multiple years, running from 2014 through 2018. I mean, years there's just, I mean, there's pages and pages of these statements all directed at a particular group of people for whom you appear to have quite a significant amount of animus. You'd be expected to oversee many of these folks in the Department of Defense. I mean, that's, that's not fairness. That's not equity. That's targeting. And for those reasons, among others, I, I can't support your nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Honey. Um, during our recent meetings, we discussed the risk to national security created by America's reliance on foreign-made microelectronics, including microchips. As you know, this is a major concern of mine, and countries like China are investing heavily to try to outcompete us, which is why I've been working with my Republican and Democratic colleagues to ensure our nation has the resources it needs to increase American microelectronics manufacturing and development. I led the effort to include $52 billion in the competitiveness bill towards this goal, with $2 billion, $2 billion allocated for efforts within DOD. And I appreciated your opening comments about the need to leverage research from experts across academia, industry, and DOD. And in your written responses to the committee, you indicated strong support for the establishment of a national network for microelectronics research that can bring those three parties together. In your view, what are the advantages of having academia and industry working in direct partnership with the Department of Defense as the national network model proposes? Senator, I thank you for your support in microelectronics and for these types of initiatives. My uh, support for this and my interest in it actually stems from my previous experiences at DARPA having uh, run a very similar type of effort in optoelectronics where we did bring together industry, academia, and the department to solve some very, pro some very profound challenges over a number of domains in optoelectronics. And so having seen that before and the tech transition and the impact that that has had on the commercial world and to then feed back new capabilities to the department that we could get out of the commercial world I believe that uh, this area of microelectronics is ripe for this type of uh, activity again. Well, thank you. And, and can you explain a little bit why uh, domestic R&D testing, production, and packaging is so critical for our nation's ability to leverage to the next generation of technologies? Senator, yes. These, as you've just identified, these are a group of technology areas that are very important to have here uh, onshore and available to our university students who are learning how to design and make parts that will feed into that part of the supply chain, and that's a part of the test environment. But it's also important for industry to have resources to go to when they face a production problem. Uh, I've uh, had some experience in doing that previously when I was uh, at Rome Lab in our test facility there, when some uh, folks from industry in, uh, the, again, the optoelectronics world faced challenges like that, they could come to us. and leverage our expertise and because we were working with so many different parts of industry and, and academia at that time, we were able to give them a much broader perspective on solving problems. And again, I think that activity would be replicated in this environment. Can you, get, can, can you give an example maybe of um, how um, currently when we need to test microelectronics and we have to do that offshore, why that is a risk to uh, our national security? Uh, Senator, these uh, types of activities, when they're done offshore, are a risk because it exposes the intellectual property, it exposes circuit design, capabilities, and our intent uh, when we do that, or there's the possibility of having that happening uh, for certain. 
So having the ability to do that here in the U.S. gives us the ability to have those layers of protection that we need for our microelectronics that we're going to use in various applications in our weapon systems and, and other places as well. And I want to, you know, highlight just for the record that some of that testing is done in China, which is not in the interest of our national security. Um, Under Secretary Xu has identified microelectronics as a priority modernization area for DOD. Um, you know, what are some of the, the the challenges that the department will face going forward uh, if we do not create a robust domestic manufacturing capability? The uh, challenges that I see, based on you know my experience at DARPA, my time uh, in the Air Force, and, and working these issues, is that uh, we have to have the ability to to work at the leading edge. We need to be able to have security for our designs. We need to have the environments where our defense industrial base can collaborate with commercial partners on the leading edge and know that the intellectual property is properly being protected. And uh, we need to be able to ensure that you know, all parts of that ecosystem that we need to master, we have the ability to do that here, or the, uh, you know, we, we've already seen uh, the democratization and spread of technology and how that has impacted us. This is a way to help ensure that when we want to let that information out, we can, but when we need to protect it, we can keep it here in the U.S. as well. Well, thank you, Dr. Honey, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Kelly. Uh, Senator.
A recent poll found that 37% of Americans have a positive view of the FBI. And that's from an NBC poll. I wouldn't exactly call that uh, right media propaganda. And I think I know why. Here's what the American people know and believe about the FBI today, sir. If you are a Trump, you'll be prosecuted. If you are a Biden, you'll be protected. And the American people that I represent are sick and tired of this double standard. It seems like every single hearing that we have in this room, we talk about the two-tiered justice system of Biden DO, uh, Biden's DOJ and the FBI. And as we were talking earlier, here we are again. President Trump endured an unprecedented raid at his home in Mar-a-Lago. President Biden's home, however, was respectfully browsed. President Trump is facing up to 400 years in federal prison for allegedly being in possession of classified documents he obtained as the commander-in-chief of these United States of America. And meanwhile, President Biden is facing no charges for the classified documents he had held at his time as a senator and a vice president, not the president of these United States of America. And last I checked, he had no legal authority to declassify those documents. Assuming President Trump was in possession of said classified documents, would those documents be more secure, surrounded by Secret Service at Mar-a-Lago, or in a box, in a garage, behind your Corvette? No, the answer to that question. Question for you, sir. What can you tell us about the status of the FBI's investigation of President Biden's classified documents found next to his Corvette in Delaware and those found at the Penn Biden Center? Do we have an update on that, sir? What I can tell you is that there is an ongoing special counsel investigation led by Mr. Robert Herr, uh, and we have FBI agents uh, affiliated with it, working on it, working very actively and aggressively with him on that case. Um, I obviously disagree with your description of the two standards, in my view.